All right, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's stakeholder meeting on the sand mining BMPs document. Uh, my name is Brad Patterson. I work at the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, and I'm in the office of the Chief Clerk. Uh, I'll be assisting my colleagues in the Water Quality Division with the uh, technical aspects of today's stakeholder meeting. Uh, we'll get the meeting started in just a few minutes. We're going to give uh, everyone who's logging on now a chance to get connected and registered. Uh, while we're waiting, uh, I'll just go over some of the logistics involved in participating in the meeting, and I'll go over this again uh, once we actually get started here in a few minutes. Uh, but on your computer, you should have a control panel that looks similar to this one. Uh, you have an audio window that you can open and close by clicking on the word audio, and it'll show how you're connected to the webinar itself. Uh, most folks, uh, when they register and log on for the first time, are connected using their computer audio by default. Um, however, if at some point your computer speakers or your computer's microphone uh, stops working, uh, you do have the option to uh, call in directly to the webinar. Um, you would press the radio button next to phone call and it'll display a phone number with an access code and a PIN number. And so you would dial the phone number, enter the access code followed by the pound sign, and then enter the PIN number followed by the pound sign. And at that point, you would be connected to the webinar uh, over your phone. Uh, you'll need to leave the webinar running on your computer. Um, but you'll have uh, access to these other features that I'm about to uh, go over as well. And so then you'd be listening to us through your phone and talking to us through your phone. On your control panel, there's a mute button. Uh, it should be red with a line through it. Right now we've got everyone muted as we go through our um, introductory remarks. Uh, but when the time comes to speak, uh, you'll need to press that button uh, to unmute yourself. It'll turn green to show that you're live uh, and we'll be able to hear you and then you press that button again to mute yourself. Uh, you've got to raise your hand button on your control panel. Uh, when, the, when the time comes for open discussion, we'll just ask you to raise your hand if you'd like to speak, um, and then pressing that button again will lower your hand. Uh, and then finally, there's a questions box. If you'd be more comfortable typing your questions in, you can do it that way. Um, and we'll just kind of go back and forth between taking uh, discussion over the air and reading questions out of the questions box for our panel. Uh, in the notice of this meeting, uh, we did include an option for those folks who don't have uh, computer access or internet access to be able to listen to the webinar via conference line. Uh, this is the number for that conference line. It's 844-368-7000. Uh, and then you'll enter uh, 435 007 when prompted. Uh, this conference line is being monitored by my colleague, uh, Jim Fernandez, and so he'll let me know if we're having any issues on the conference line. Uh, this conference line is like any other conference line. Uh, anyone who calls into that line can hear anyone else, and so it's very important if you choose to call into the conference line uh, that once you are connected that you go ahead and mute your own phone so that anyone else who's listening uh, won't be distracted by any background noise or interference. All right, it is 9.05. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, once again, welcome to this stakeholder meeting on the Sand Mining BMPs document. Uh, once again, my name is Brad Patterson. I'm with the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, or TCEQ for short. Uh, I'm in the office of the Chief Clerk, and I'm uh, helping out with today's webinar. Uh, on the technical side, uh, in a moment, we'll uh, start introductions of our panelists. Uh, but before we do that, I just want to go over uh, the logistics involved in participating in today's meeting. So if you're at a computer, uh, you should have a control panel that looks similar to this one. Uh, most folks, when they log on for the first time, are connected using their computer audio. And so if you have a working speakers and a working microphone, uh, we encourage you to use your computer for today's webinar. However, at some point you realize that your computer's microphone is not working, you do have the option to switch over to a phone call. Uh, you would press the radio button next to phone call and it'll display the call and information. It'll give you a phone number, an access code, and a PIN number. Uh, you would dial the phone number, uh, enter the access code followed by the pound sign, and enter the PIN number followed by the pound sign. 
And at that point, uh, you'll be listening to us through your phone and you would talk to us through your phone. Uh, leave the webinar running on your computer and that'll give you access to these other features that I'm about to go over as well. Uh, everyone should have a mute button on their control panel. It's red with a line through it to show that you're muted. Uh, when the time comes to talk to us, you'll need to press that button and it should turn green to show that you're no longer muted. Pressing the button again will put you back on mute. Uh, when we start taking questions, we'll ask you to raise your hand if you'd like to speak. Uh, there's a raise your hand button that you would push to show us. Um, and then you can push that button again to lower your hand. And then finally, there's a questions box that you should have access to. Uh, if you'd be more comfortable typing in questions or if you're at a computer and the microphone isn't working, you could type in your questions and we could take them that way. Uh, and then finally, uh, in the notice of this meeting, uh, we provided an option for those who don't have access to a computer uh, or the internet. Uh, we've set up a conference line that we've connected to the webinar. Uh, and here's the number for that. It's 844-368-7161. It'll ask for a collaboration code, which is 435-007. And it's very important that once you uh, get connected to the conference line, uh, that you go ahead and mute your own phone so that anyone else who's listening on that conference line won't be distracted by any background noise interference that's coming through your line. And my colleague Jim Fernandez is monitoring that line and he'll let me know if we're having any issues. Uh, and then as a final reminder, uh, there is a copy of the agenda uh, attached to the webinar uh, as a handout uh, if you need access to that. Uh, but with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn the floor over to Michaela Coleman, who is with the uh, Water Quality Division. Michaela? Thank you, Brad. Okay, is everyone seeing it okay? You see it. All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this virtual stakeholder meeting about the sand mining best management practices guidance document being developed in support of the ongoing rulemaking for sand mining facilities in the San Jacinto River watershed. We appreciate all of you joining us. We're hosting this in virtual format because public access to TCEQ offices remains limited at this time. Uh, during this meeting, please keep the following reminders in mind. The meeting is being recorded. Please share airtime, air allow everyone an opportunity to speak. <clears throat> if you would like to speak, raise your hand and a moderator will unmute your microphone. If you joined via the conference phone line, please say you would like to speak. A moderator will then unmute the phone line or type questions and comments in the chat box. And if you called in, please mute your phone line to minimize background noise. Please also note that we have saved time for questions and discussions during the last part of the meeting. Therefore, during the meeting, please hold your verbal questions or comments until that time. However, at any time during the meeting, you may use the GoToWebinar chat box to submit a question or comment and we will address it during the discussion time. So now we would like to introduce ourselves so that everyone knows who the speakers are and the panelists from TCEQ and also give the petitioners an opportunity to introduce themselves. So I'll start. Uh, my name is Robert Sadler. I'm the Deputy Director, Water Quality Division, TCEQ. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Rebecca Villalba and I am the team leader for the Storm Water Team. My name is Michaela Coleman, and I'm a permit writer with the Stormwater Team. My name is Michael Parr, and I'm a staff attorney with the Water Quality Section. Our petitioners, uh, if you'd like to introduce yourselves. Yeah, Go ahead. And, um, my name is Josh Leftwich. I'm the president and CEO of the Texas Aggregate Concrete Association. And my name is Bill McCabe, and I'm a representative of the, of the Lake Houston Area Grassroots Flood Prevention Initiative. Gosh, thank you, Bill. So here's a look at today's agenda. <clears throat> As you can see, we will present the following information and then open the floor to discussions and questions. 
uh, goals and objectives with presenters from TCEQ and our stakeholder groups. And then Rebecca Vialba and Michaela Coleman will trade off uh, with an overview of rulemaking timeline and BMP's guidance document. Summary of proposed rule language, BMPs and stormwater, and finally an overview of the draft BMPs guidance documents. Um, and I think that I skipped over something. Uh, we'd like to, before we get started, we'd like to read off the names of the stakeholders in attendance. Sure thing. Hi, this is Brad with the Office of the Chief Clerk again. Uh, we've got about 15 folks uh, who are with us today, uh, and they include uh, Christina Ridge, uh, who's with Trinity Consultants, uh, Joey Eikhoff and uh, Patrick Reitmeyer, both with the city of Houston. Um, we have uh, Jill Bullion with the Bayou Land Conservancy, uh, Jacob McCurry with Talent Materials, uh, Richard Hyde with Hyde Regulatory Consulting, uh, Tom Hager with Texas Parks and Wildlife, uh, Gary Nichols with Westward Environmental, uh, Daniel Goshen, uh, Susan Meckel, who's with LCRA, uh, Bob Riak, uh, and Brianna Gallagher with the SJRA and uh, Brant Mansion. So thank you everyone for being here this morning. Thank you, Brad. I think that concludes the introductions. So Rebecca. Um, so good morning again, um, everybody. We appreciate your time uh, attending the stakeholder meeting. This is the second time we, we meet with you all. Um, so just quickly go over the goals and objectives of this meeting from the TCQ perspective. Now we want to have the stakeholder meeting to continue to facilitate uh, stakeholder participation regarding the sand mining rulemaking process that we have. And as part of that rulemaking process, of course, we have the sand mining best management practices guidance document that is an integral part of the implementation of that rule when it gets finalized. So we are working on developing and finalizing the guidance document. So this is the stakeholder meeting to get input on our current draft of the BMP's document. So we wanted, you know, one of the goals is to facilitate discussion. Uh, we want to review, go over with you what that BMP's guidance document looks like, what it entails, explain um, some of the items in that document to get your input. And um, then we want to gather your input and uh, answer any questions you might have at the end of, of the presentation that we have set up for you. So those are the goals from our TCQ perspective. And again, um, I want to say that this specific stakeholder meeting is regarding the sand mining BMP's guidance document. We are not going to receive comments right now on the rule. That meeting for the rule um, public meeting is going to be this Thursday in the afternoon. Uh, today is about the sand mining BMP's guidance document, so keep that in mind. However, since it is, um, they're interconnected, you will hear about the rule itself. Um, at the beginning of, of this of our presentation. So now we will move over to Mr. McCabe, uh, who is one of the petitioners. Okay, thank you, Rebecca. Yeah, uh, as I said, my name is Bill McCabe, and I represent the, the Lake Houston <clears throat> Grassroots Flood Prevention Initiative. We were formed uh, shortly after Hurricane Harvey uh, and have been trying to uh, alleviate uh, future flooding uh, experiences in the, uh, on the San Jacinto River and the San Jacinto watershed. This morning, I, I just kind of like to give a broad overview. I'm not going to go into a, a lot of detail simply because um, we're still in the process of going over the, the BMP document itself with our experts and but just to give you a kind of a broad um, perspective of, of where we're going, uh, there are three areas that, uh, that we see that, that may need some, uh, some addressing as we go forward. The first one is, is definitional. A lot of the, the, the definitions 
uh, are not as specific as we would like them and uh, will require some modifications. For instance, uh, the next anticipated storm event, we're, we're not exactly sure how that's going to be defined, how we're going to be able to determine that, or when that will happen. So um, there are several instances of that, um, you know, uh, stockpiling, how's that to be defined, and whatever. But as, as this progresses, we will submit written documentation with our concerns regarding the, the definitions. And, um, and I, I know uh, Jill and Bob have some other comments that they, I, I'm sure, will want to share with you uh, uh, later on. The second area that we were concerned about is the, uh, he will call it enforcement, but basically, and this is the, the statement that I'd like to, uh, to get across, uh, best management practices or BMPs are required to operate as intended. Now, that's a, a pretty broad statement, and we'd like a little bit more um, information as to how that's going to be accomplished. I mean, the, the TCEQ and uh, Josh and I, in conjunction, have put together what I think is a, is a very good set of uh, <clears throat> BMPs, but uh, I think we need some further clarification as to how these will actually be implemented in um, um, uh, further. And, and, and just to give you one instance of, of what I'm talking about, um, you know, in the uh, in, in section 2.1 under vegetative controls, the third paragraph, it says site operators must inspect and document. But then in the uh, structural controls, it says site operators must inspect, but it doesn't have anything about documentation. So we just like so, some more clarification of those along those lines. And like I say, I'll send in and, and um, uh, TRAN and some of the other organizations will send in some specifics on these, but just a lot of it's clarification. Um, some of it's just the changing of a word from should to must. I, I know the, uh, the, the must uh, mandates are, are, are fairly consistent throughout here, but there are some instances where we think it should be a, a mandatory <clears throat> BMP where it seems to, to waffle just a little bit on, the, uh, uh, on the, the, the may or may not side. So that's, that's one thing that we like clarify. What must be done, what's optional, and, and what's uh, infeasible, okay? And then the third area uh, has to do with the, the final stabilization. Um, you know, I, I think uh, the final stabilization report is actually a blueprint for restoration and reclamation of the site. As such, it is just important that the beginning of operations is at the end. For standby, the stabilization report should be submitted with the original application and updated annually to reflect areas already mined and restored leaving all restoration and reclamation until the very end is, is not in the best interest of the sand liners or the public. So that's another area of concern. Um, like, like I say, we're, we're still reviewing the documents, but those are the, the three areas that we've kind of honed in on and would, uh, would like just some more clarification. Like I say, I think TCQ has done a great job of putting this all together and I, I really appreciate your efforts. Um, and, and as we work through until I believe August 19th is our final date to, 
a comment. We'll get you some written comments on all facets that uh, that we think. But it, it's you know there there's certainly nothing that that can't be addressed. So we'll we'll uh, um, proceed working together with uh, with Josh and with TCEQ to uh, to clarify some of this. Thank you. All righty, well, I'll go ahead then. Um, so my name, once again, is Josh Lefwich, and I represent the Texas Aggregate and Concrete Association here in Texas. Um, if you don't know what TACA does, um, we're a statewide trade association um, representing most of the, you know, 75, 80 percent of the aggregate companies, 75 percent of the concrete companies, and 100 percent of the cement producers in Texas. So um, we have a broad representation across the state, lots of different areas, um, lots of different, um, you know, types of, you know, cities out, out to the country across the state where we operate. Um, I want to first of all thank TCEQ for um, putting this BMP document together. Uh, I think it's a very good um, framework and good start to um, this rulemaking and to get this rulemaking finalized. Um, we're pretty happy with most of the um, BMPs that are in here. I think the overall theme of the document is good. Um, I think that one thing we need to just be mindful of is these are best management practices and we need to make sure there's we allow the flexibility for operators to um, come up with new creative um ways to have bmps too that are um, fit within their properties and you know depending on their site characteristics that they can implement um these bmps and under uh you know we can work with tcq on how that's implemented but i just think overall we need to allow that flexibility and not get too locked down on very specific types of prescribed BMPs too. Um, every operator operates a little differently and even though the area is very generally the same, operations um, can be different and this I think there's a flexibility needed. I think we can do it with um, PG, PE sign-offs and those type of things that um, are already implemented and other TCQ programs out there. So but I think overall it's a good guidance document and we will um, submit written comments on the whole document. Um, but those are just my overall general thoughts on the BMP document so far. Thank you. Okay, so we will, you know, th thank you, Mr. McCabe and Mr. Lefwich. You know, we will now continue with the rest of the presentation. And again, our goal is to provide this um, topics right now that are coming up with a, just make sure everybody is back on the same page, tell you where we are in the rulemaking, where we are in the guidance document in terms of the process and timeline. We're also going to uh, discuss the proposed rule um tell you a little bit about bmps and stormwater so everybody has the basic understanding of that so that's when we continue to discuss uh the bmps guidance document everybody understands uh, how things um, work in the stormwater program so we will then like i said do a, a pretty good overview of the bmps document take it piece by piece and then we will open up the floor to uh discussion you know we want to hear your input what do you think any items that we need to address in addition to what TACA and uh, FPI just provided. Uh, we welcome your input and again, you know, answer any questions that you might have. So we will start first of all with the overview of the rulemaking process and then the BMP's guidance document timeline. So just to you know re remind everybody, you know, we received two petitions, you know, almost 13 months ago from 
uh, TACA and FPI, and that started the whole process. We went then to our commissioners um, on August 12th of last year to present the petitions, and we received approval to proceed with the rulemaking, specifically also including stakeholder involvement. So we started you know, that process August of last year. Um, then currently the, the draft, the proposed rule has been published in the Texas Register. It was June 25th and right now we are in the, almost the end of the 30 day comment period. We have a web page where you can go um, look and download uh, any information regarding the rulemaking process. And um, you can go at your leisure and view that. So the rulemaking timeline, just to let you know, we have three phases in the rulemaking process. One is the stakeholder phase and the proposal phase, and then the adoption phase. So right now we are currently in the proposal phase for the rulemaking. Uh, we already had uh, a stakeholder meeting on the rule that was last December. We received your comments. We reviewed the comments and based on that, we finalized the draft rule. We took it to, com no, we also had internal review. We took it to commission and then commission approved to publish. So right now, like I said, we are in that 30 day comment period. And then the next stage is going to be adoption. Once we receive comments, we will review the comments, prepare what we call a response to public documents, response to public comments document, um, and we will finalize the rule. And then at that point, we will go to commissioners again to present what we believe would be the final rule, then they would adopt it and the rule then will become effective 20 calendar days after filing. So the next slide is just a different way of showing you the, the timeline for the rulemaking. Uh, this is specifically for the rule. So you can see the dates and where we are. And like I said, right now we are um, going to have the public hearing or meeting uh, this coming Thursday. And then the 30 day comment period is going to end on July 27th. And right now we're looking at this rule being adopted and finalized on November of this year. So then moving on to the BMP's guidance document. The BMP's document, as the title of the presentation says, it is a supplemental, uh, it is an integral part of the rule. So we have the two pieces. We have the rule and then we have the BMP's guidance document that are going to work together. Uh, however, the BMP's document is a separate parallel process that is going on right now. And you know what we are going to mainly discuss in this uh, stakeholder meeting and what we've already shared with you is our draft guidance document. It is a 27 page regulatory guidance document that definitely um, has a lot of involvement and in input from not only the petitioners, you know, we took the petitioner's initial request and that really set the framework as to how this guidance document was going to look, look like and what it was going to include. Uh, we asked for input from you stakeholders during the meeting that we had on December 10th. And then we also uh, ran those items through our internal agency review. We have a, a, a team that we need to, um, share this document with, get their input. So we did that. We compiled all those um, thoughts, concerns, ideas, um, feedback, and we created this document that we feel is a pretty good draft to get our discussion going. And just know that this is moving in a separate um, parallel process. So we also have a timeline for this guidance document. And the next slide will show you what that timeline looks like. So we also have three phases. Right now we're in the phase one, specifically for this guidance document. This is our first stakeholder meeting focused just on this BMP's guidance document. Comments from you will be due on August 19th. We will review them and then that will start our second phase where we will then incorporate and revise, um, incorporate those comments and revise the guidance document accordingly. And then, if needed, we don't know, but if needed, we are open to having a second stakeholder meeting to discuss any changes or any concerns that we think uh, might need to be brought back up to everybody for discussion. Um, then our final stage is adoption where we're going to incorporate everything, make the document final. And then we have to go through internal agency 
review because it's going to be an official agency document and we have to also go through the design process so there's a different process that we have to follow with timelines for that and then the publication is going to be formally published at the same time as the rule so the next slide has um, more uh, different way to show the timeline but with real with dates in there so that you know that again this rule um, and the timeline for the BMP's document are moving parallel but they're going to come at the finish line at the same time they're both going to be published um, in November together okay so then now we move over to Michaela where she's going to give us a a short summary uh, overview of the proposed rule so that everybody understands the, the basics of this rule. Thank you, Rebecca. Like Rebecca said, um, although this meeting isn't for us to discuss the rule language specifically, um, in order to understand the BMP's guidance document, we wanna make sure everybody is familiar with what the language in the proposed rule is um, to help uh, maybe help you make decisions on what things in the document you feel are necessary or would like to see changes on. Okay, so our proposed rule for sand mining facilities is um, a new subchapter in Chapter 311 or the Watershed Protection in Title 30 Texas Administrative Code, so it would come in as subchapter J best management practices for aggregate production operations within the San Jacinto River Basin. So the rule is gonna start out by providing some definitions um, to clarify the language used within the subchapter. So the first definition is going to be an aggregate production operation or an EPO, and it kind of references the definition already included in chapter 342 of the Texas Administrative Code. We also propose to define best management practices as schedules of activities, prohibition of practices, um, and other similar things that are gonna be used to protect water quality in the state. Continuing on with some of those definitions, we also include a definition for infeasible. And in the context of this rule, that's referring to something that's not either technologically or economically practicable um, for a facility in light of whatever best industry practices exist. And we are including a definition for minimize, which is of course to reduce or eliminate to the extent achievable with control measures. Any, um, excuse me, with control measures that are technologically available or economically practicable. Then we also define an operator as the person responsibility, the person responsible, excuse me, for the management of an APO facility that's subject to this subchapter. So the APO facility subject to the rule, whoever is responsible for managing them would meet the definition of operator. Additionally, we're defining sand mining facilities specifically as APOs that are engaged in activities described by standard industrial classification codes 1442 and 1446. So that includes industrial and construction sand mining facilities. And then additionally, it could apply to any other APO that the executive director determines to be a sand mining facility and then sends written notice to that APO operator. Um, a pretty important definition which um, the stakeholders helped us determine is how we're defining the San Jacinto River watershed. So since the rule is applying to all facility, all sand mining facilities within this watershed, and we have to have a good definition. So the definition we used is this portions of the San Jacinto River watershed that includes the watershed of these water bodies and their tributaries, which includes the East Fork of the San Jacinto River, Peach Creek, Caney Creek, the West Fork of the San Jacinto River, Lake Creek, Spring Creek, and Cypress Creek. Uh, and then also included in the proposed rule is this graphic. Um, we're a little limited in how the graphic can look in um, the Texas Administrative Code. It has to be pretty simplistic and black and white. So we developed this one 
specifically to be included in the proposed rule it's just giving a general idea of the watershed location within the state um, and you'll see later we've prepared a, a little bit more detailed version of the map as part of the guidance document and then the final definition we included in the rule proposed rule is for storm event and we're defining that as a precipitation event that results in a measurable amount of precipitation the next section in the proposed rule is going to be scope and applicability so it's just defining kind of the purpose of the rule and who it applies to and in this case the purpose of the rule is to regulate sand mining facilities to protect water quality using bmps and the rule is going to apply like i said to sand mining facilities located within the san jacinto river watershed which you know we defined earlier and then it's also going to direct us to develop and maintain the guidance document of BMPs that these sand mining facilities are going to use. And so that's kind of why we're here today is we want to make sure that whenever the rule is adopted, we have this guidance document ready to go. And so that's kind of our focus of the meeting today. The next section of the proposed rule is called general requirements. So it's going to specify what these sand mining facility operators need to do um, in compliance with the rule. So the first is that the sand mining facility operators need to develop and implement all the vegetative and structural control best management practices that are identified in the guidance document, which we will see a little bit later what, what we suggest those controls look like as part of the guidance document. We also indicate that sand mining facility operators need to identify, develop, and implement all the other BMPs identified in the guidance document specifically for the pre-mining, mining, and post-mining phases of a facility's operation. Um, but we do include the caveat unless they are infeasible as it's defined in the rule. Um, and then if an operator determines that one of these BMPs is infeasible, they're required to use an alternate equivalent BMP and then maintain documentation of the reason that the BMP was infeasible and we provide some considerations for how they can determine if a BMP is infeasible, including things like financial considerations, um, any local restrictions, and of course, a lot of the factors at the site, like soils, slope, um, the available area, and other similar considerations. The rule would also require operators to install and maintain all their control measures in accordance with manufacturer specifications and good engineering practices. They're also required to replace or modify controls after inspections, and they must be done in a timely manner, but no later than the next anticipated storm event. And finally, the certification of BMPs we're requiring that operators obtain certification of the design and installation of new and existing best management practices from either a licensed Texas professional engineer or a professional geoscientist. And that would need to be done before they start or continue their regulated activities. We also included a final stabilization report requirement as part of the proposed rule. It would require the sand mining facility operators to submit to TCEQ a final stabilization report that we would review and approve. Um, and it's going to require that they develop it in accordance with the guidance document. So you'll see when we look at the guidance document, we include kind of a framework for what this report needs to, needs to have in it. And then that report also will need to be signed and certified by a Texas licensed professional engineer or geoscientist and then they'll have to receive our approval before they implement this plan and um, they will have to have implemented all the elements of the plan before they can terminate operations at the site or cancel any permit authorizations that their site may have um, required under chapter 205 or 305 in the texas administrative code and then lastly the general requirements also indicate that the executive director may conduct investigations in addition to our review of the final stabilization report 
and then require sand mining facility operators to maintain any documentation um, to show their compliance with this subchapter. So as I mentioned, you know, today's meeting is focused more on the BMP's guidance document, but if you're interested in providing us feedback on the rule language, you still have opportunity to do so through public comment. The public comment period is still open until July 27. And then, like Rebecca mentioned, the public hearing on the proposed rule is happening Thursday afternoon, July 22nd. So if you are interested in submitting comments, you can do so with written comments or electronically. And all of this information is also included on our rulemaking webpage, so you can refer back to that after the meeting if you're interested in providing comment on the proposed rule. So now I'm going to hand it over to Rebecca and let her talk a little bit about BMPs and stormwater. Thank you, Michaela. Um, so great overview of the proposed rule. So if you haven't read the rule yet, this gives you the opportunity to understand where we're coming from and how it's structured. And so now we want to talk a little bit about what are BMPs really, you know, what's the purpose of BMPs and how they play a big role in stormwater and protecting water quality. So stormwater um, is pretty much anything that's falling from the sky that's precipitation. You know, rain, snow melt, um, and surface runoff and drainage. And um, stormwater program regulates industrial construction and municipal activities to make sure that stormwater is clean. But specifically for this rule, you know, we want to point out the stormwater discharges that are associated with industrial activities such as sand mining are already uh, more than likely covered by one of our individual or general permits. Stormwater permits definitely um, are the way to control and protect water quality and pollution prevention and minimizing exposure pollutants through the implementation of BMPs is a requirement of either an individual or general permit because that is how we are going to ensure in that industries um, are protecting water quality. What is the best management practice? Michaela already a little bit uh, earlier ago mentioned that we have a definition in the proposed rule for best management practices. We want to also let you know that we also have a definition of best management practices in our multi-sector general permit known as the MSGP. So that MSGP um, includes best management practices as being a schedule of activities or controls that are needed to be implemented at that site by that operator to ensure that either they're minimizing or preventing pollutants from being uh, exposed or included as part of the runoff that then leads to water quality issues or problems or erosion. So those are that's pretty much the purpose of a best management practice. System. They can be, again, practices or they can be a control. So continuing on with that, you know, the, the best management practices either support a numeric effluent limit if it's already included in the permit or it's in place of a numeric limit. So for example, a numeric limit is um, for lead, you have a real number like 1.5 milligrams per liter that if a discharge in stormwater um, is sampled, it should not exceed that, for example. But you also could have a best management practices practice implemented to support that limit or in place of that limit, depending on um, how the permit is set up. And so we just want you to know that it is considered a limitation, but it's more of a narrative limitation instead of a numeric limitation. Best management practices, as I said a little bit earlier, can be structural or non-structural controls. Um, an example of a structural control is the sill fence. You know, most of you are familiar with sill fences because they are used um, a lot at construction sites. That is a structural control. It is something that is a um, structure that is put in place to help prevent 
uh, erosion in this case, or sediment uh, from being um, moved into uh, surface water. Then the part of the non-structural example comes into place is you have a silt fence, but then you need to inspect that silt fence to make sure that it's working properly, that it hasn't fallen, that it hasn't deteriorated. And so there needs to be inspections, uh, those that need to be documented. And if that silt fence is not working, it wasn't a good structural control, then a new BMP needs to be included that is more effective in controlling you know, the, the source of the problem. So as you can see, these structural controls or the non-structural controls can be site-specific because as Michaela said earlier, there's a lot of considerations that need to be um, looked into for a site, such as the, the topography, the soil conditions, how close they are to a water body. So there's a lot of things that need to be considered when selecting a best management practice. The uh, stormwater program in the general permit, the MSGP, they are required or industrial facilities are required to develop what we call a storm pollution prevention plan. This is a document that includes everything that that site is going to do to protect water quality and to implement the requirements of the multi sector general permit. So I want you all to understand that sand mines, for the most part, are already regulated under the MSGP and they already include a stormwater pollution prevention plan that has best management practices. So aside from this rule that we have, and aside from this BMP's guidance document, sand mining facilities already have this stormwater pollution prevention plan and already have best management practices in place. So they, um, in the stormwater pollution prevention plan, are required to include the potential sources of pollution coming from that site. So a sand mining facility, for this example, for our purposes, needs to look at that site and determine what are the potential sources of pollution that could be attributing to a problem in water quality. And they need to address those sources. So they need to then establish practices or any controls that are needed to make sure that that source is addressed. And so they need to describe those practices and controls as appropriate for their site in that stormwater pollution prevention plan. The stormwater pollution prevention plan, as I said already, has um, sand mining facilities addressing good housekeeping measures, erosion and sediment control, structural controls, employee training. That is a key part of a stormwater pollution prevention plan is that employees need to be trained because sometimes you have controls, but if nobody's inspecting them or do not know how to inspect them appropriately, then an issue may not be adequately addressed. They also need to address spill prevention and response plan and have a maintenance program. Then as part of the MSGP, they're also required that prior to terminating permit coverage at the site or even the portion of the site, the sand mining facility must achieve final stabilization at the site or return it to a land, return the land to an alternative post mining land use. So these are requirements already uh, in the MSGP that some sand mining facilities in the San Jacinto River area and across the state are having to, to implement and follow. Okay, so that was a real quick overview of what BMPs are and the stormwater program, specifically the multi-sector zone permit that regulates sand mining facilities for you to know what sand mining facilities already have to do in addition to what this proposed rule is going to require. So this proposed rule is going to be more stringent in terms of what we are going to be requesting and needing from sand mining facilities in the San Jacinto River area. But please note that they're already doing a lot as being required by the MSGP. So now that we have the basic understanding of what BMPs are, stormwater, what sand mining facilities are already required to do, and also you have a foundation of what our proposed rule is going to include. Now we will move specifically to address um, all the items that we have in the BMPs document and Michaela will proceed with that. And she will explain what we have in, in that document, how it's set up so that you can then um, 
provide your input after this presentation. We'll have a break and then you will return and you can provide our input and we'll open up the floor for discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Okay, so this draft BMP's guidance document is being developed, of course, in conjunction with our rulemaking to show the types of best management practices that are gonna be required by these sand mining operators. And the BMPs are selected, of course, to protect water quality from those potential pollutants that are present at sand mining sites, to minimize exposure of those pollutants, prevent erosion, and manage runoff at the site. So kind of the first section of the draft guidance document addresses vegetative controls. Vegetative controls are generally an inexpensive and effective way to protect soil from erosion and stabilize the site. And so some of the different vegetative controls included in the document include vegetative buffer zones, sod stabilization, temporary and permanent seeding, mulching, erosion and sediment control blankets, and then surface roughening um, for, for that seeding. The next section of the document addresses structural controls at the site. So structural controls can be used to divert flows away from the areas of the site that are disturbed to reduce runoff velocities. So to slow down the runoff, to filter out sediment or remove sediment in ponds. And the structural controls, um, of course, are gonna have to be implemented in compliance with any local rules or permitting requirements. So some of the different best management practices um, in the structural control section include temporary and permanent structures, diversion ridges, berms, or channels of stabilized soil, silt fences or straw belt barriers, sediment basins, riprap outlet protection, check dams, uh, construction entrance and exits, good housekeeping practices, and then post-construction stormwater management measures. And then in addition to all of the BMPs for vegetative and structural controls, which are being implemented site-wide, there are some specific phases of mining um, that need to be addressed. So at all times, facilities would be implementing vegetative and structural controls. And then those kinds of controls are also going to be implemented during the different phases of the mine site. So in the pre-mining, mining, and post-mining. So in addition to those vegetative and structural controls, they have um, some more specific BMPs for the pre-mining, mining, and post-mining. So the, the next section addresses that pre-mining phase. And that's mostly just to address the kind of advanced planning of the entire mining process in consideration of what's gonna happen to the site whenever they're done mining. So it includes site evaluation. So evaluating how they're planning to mine, um, including what kind of sequences they're gonna follow. Um, determining the, the soils at the site using those US Department of Agriculture soil maps to understand the, the soil characteristics at their site understanding their site drainage, how surface water flows, and identifying what the receiving water bodies are for their site, and if those receiving water bodies have any impairments they need to be aware of. It also involves understanding the site drainage. So what's the topography of the site? How is um, water gonna move around? And it also means the groundwater conditions, so checking to see if there are any wells at the site that need to be um, addressed or closed or you know, anything like that. And then how they're gonna prepare the site for the mining process. Do they need to construct access or haul roads? Those roads will need to be crowned, graveled and compacted and include ditching and culverting and silt fencing to protect pollutant runoff from, from those areas. Um, they'll also need to perform some land clearing and grubbing. And as part of that, they might be installing or constructing sediment basins before they do any major grading. Um, they wanna divert water upslope around 
the planned areas of disturbance, um, any stripping activities. If there are going to be stockpiles, you want to implement controls around those to, to regulate runoff from that area of the site. Um, and leaving an undisturbed buffer, you know, as, as appropriately determined by that licensed professional engineer who's certifying the BMPs at the site. And then next is the actual mining phase. So what additional efforts are needed during the actual mining to reduce and eliminate pollutant discharge from those areas? So where there are dredging activities or the aggregate wash area or the, the wet processing at a site, there needs to be proper berming and ditching of the pump water from the dredge uh, and then runoff from stockpiles again being controlled and, and routed to, to the open pit so that water's not going into the surface water. And then they need to address the, the dry processing area or the aggregate processing plant area. It's also going to include maintenance areas. So the spill prevention control and countermeasure plans that they're going to have in place, um, making sure that any fuel or oil storage at the site is away from the, the sediment and wash water retention facility, having containment monitoring and collection systems, runoff from um, adjacent surfaces being routed to a monitored retention pond, and if there are any petroleum storage tanks, making sure that they're registered with TCQ the way that they're supposed to be, um, providing secondary containment, proper signage, and pollution prevention equipment with that petroleum storage tank handling area, um, and then regular inspections occurring and, and being documented. Then, of course, for the post-mining phase, after, after mining has, has stopped, it's going to require site stabilization, so making sure that there's slope stability, um, not letting cut and fill slopes exceed uh, two to one. Diversions being installed at the tops of slopes to divert runoff from the slope banks to a more stable outlet. Chutes, uh, aggregate line to concentrate flow to outlets, and then soil conservation reclaiming any abandoned roadways, removing temporary structures, any bridges, culverts, cattle guard signs, and then seeding any bare ground that might still be at the site or have been created at the site as part of this removal. Of course, removing any debris and vegetative waste. Um, and then of course, we, as part of the document, we provide some guidance on, on the different measures for removing waste, whether it be burned in accordance with TCQ rules or being disposed of according to municipal solid waste rules, and then grading the property. So grading has to be completed to minimize that stormwater pollution impact to receiving water bodies. And then finally, as we mentioned as part of the proposed rule, we're including um, instructions for this final stabilization report. So at a minimum, that report needs to demonstrate that each of these items have been addressed. So they need to demonstrate that they've established vegetative cover in you know, all areas that don't have permanent structures or paved areas. They need to show that the vehicle equipment storage and maintenance areas are cleaned up. So they've removed fluids and batteries from any equipment, all equipment and vehicles remaining on site have been cleaned and that all fuel and chemicals have been removed from those maintenance areas. And then of course to show that they've removed temporary controls and that any permanent controls remaining on the site are going to be adequate to, to manage the site. They will need to demonstrate that all high walls remaining in the site are stable and safe that all of the waste from the site has been removed in accordance with TCQ rules. If there's a landowner agreement, if the site operator is not the landowner and somebody else is, um, they may have an agreement on, on what the site's going to look like whenever they're done. And if that's the case, they'll include the agreement as part of their final stabilization report. And then finally, this report needs to be signed 
and certified by a licensed Texas professional engineer or geoscientist to indicate that you know what they're proposing is adequate for the site. And then I mentioned earlier that the um, BMP's guidance document would include a, a little bit more detailed map for um, the watershed area. And this is that map. So it's showing in more detail with the actual segments in the watershed. Um, and still the county boundaries and then the, the watershed boundary. So this is the, the map we propose to include as part of that BMP guidance document. Okay, so that concludes my quick summary of you know, the, the information we've included in the draft guidance document. Before we dive into our stakeholder discussion and input, I think we wanna take a quick break, just 10 minutes or so. Um, so it looks like it's 10.02 right now. So we'll pause for 10 minutes and we'll come back about 10.12 and, and open up the stakeholder discussion and, and hear from you all. Thank you, Michaela. We'll return in 10 minutes.
Are we back yet? Yes, our 10 minutes are coming to an end right now. All right, uh, Michaela, Rebecca, are you all ready to get started again? Yes. Did you want to uh, kick off the discussion by addressing uh, the questions we got from Bob first? How many questions do we have? Just those two? Just those two from Bob. Uh, for the rest of you who are listening, uh, for the purposes of this part of the meeting, if, if you'd like to ask questions about any information that you've heard, please use the raise your hand button on your control panel to let us know, uh, or you can type questions into the questions box. Uh, and also if you have comments that you'd like to provide, uh, we'll get to those as part of the discussion that we're having as well. But we had uh, two questions from Bob. Uh, his first question is, what does clean all equipment remaining on site mean? Are they required to remove the equipment uh, or wash it? I can take that one. Um, this is Michaela, the TCQ stormwater team. So as written, we mean that the equipment needs to be cleaned, not removed. If you know that's something you think should be written differently, by all means, please submit you know, a written comment. We can, we can have some discussion about that as well. Um, but as written, we mean clean, clean the equipment that might remain on site. Thank you. And another question from Bob is, how do you intend to handle equipment abandoned on site after the site is abandoned? It's a good question. I think it, it will depend a little bit on if, if there's an agreement between the operator and a separate landowner about whether or not that equipment can remain on site. Um, and so that's something that they're going to be required to include in their final stabilization report that they would submit to us. Um, and something we could address as, as part of that review of the, the final stabilization report. Rebecca, do you have anything to add? Yes, I would like to add that the multi site general permit, when somebody is going to terminate activities at the site and part of terminating their uh, authorization, they are required to remove any equipment that is no longer going to be used or um, that is going to be a permanent structure on that site. So that is also a requirement already in the multi-sector general permit. If a sand mining facility is already covered by that permit, they need to address that regardless of this rule or BMP's guidance document. All right. And so then Bob had another question. It says there is a conflict between the map of the watershed and the text, which explains which streams are covered. Uh, the latter leaves many streams out. And he suggests using the map. So we developed the map based on the text. So the text read the um, it gave the list of water bodies and their tributaries. So the map does show the tributaries. Um, but in text, it's just referred to as the tributaries of those water bodies. So basically what we did is first we found those water bodies um, and used the US Geological Survey um, existing watersheds to determine what watershed would encompass that water body and its tributaries. So they should match, um, but if you still feel there's some kind of discrepancy, you know, please provide a comment. I'm, I'm happy to look at them again and, and make sure that they, they match up. Thank you, Michaela. Um, we have a hand raised from uh, Jill Bullion. So we'll go ahead and unmute Jill and invite Jill to ask her question. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Jill Bullion. I'm the executive director of the Bayou Land Conservancy. We're a nonprofit land conservation organization and our area of conservation focus 
is the same footprint that we're talking about today for these BMPs. So I have some questions and comments, um, and so this might be a little bit more of kind of a give and take, uh, if that's okay. Um, I want to thank, first of all, our petitioners, the Flood Prevention Initiative and TACA for working with the TCEQ to develop this um, guidance document, because I think it gives us a really good place to start and brings forth a lot of um, minor issues that we need to take a look at. Um, Bill mentioned earlier that some of the definitions um, that they'll be taking a look at, as we will also. Um, one of those is the next storm event. I think we've mentioned that already. Um, but I think it would be good in the best management practices to provide some guidance to operators to um, consult with the Weather Service Flood Alerts or NOAA or even Harris County Flood Control District's flood level warnings so that they have um, actually a place to reference. So it's not so ambiguous what a um, storm event is. That's a great comment, thank you. Uh-huh, and then um, I think it's section 3.2.1. Um, there's a reference to the USGS topographic data. I think it would be very valuable for um, use of LIDAR data when that data is available and it should be, if not already, then very soon for this um, watershed area. Um, Jill, can you repeat what what was that data that you say may soon be LIDAR, available? LIDAR, L-I-D-A-R. It is um, a uh, they use airplanes to fly over and get that data using um, a, a it's a light emitting radar device. <laughs> yeah, that's something we can we can certainly look into if if not you know, to do now, at least in future versions. Okay. Um, you've already, one of our questions was just the definition of the watershed. I think you've addressed that. Having the map for us is very helpful because there are a lot of small tributaries in the, in the watershed that we want to make sure are included. Um, the buffer zones, though, is an area of concern for us. It's referenced, um, in a, several places, I think, regarding vegetative uh, controls. And I think that um, the tough question here is that the, those rivers are not static, they move. Um, that's what they do, especially rivers that are in very sandy soils. So how does this best management practice document um, allow for that? And um, we would suggest that some language may be included that would require the operator to maintain a consistent buffer over time and allow for lateral migration of the stream. I know that some, I know that some places um, across the country are using a channel migration zone. So that might be something um, to look at as well. Okay. Um, and I just want to add, this goes for, for you, Jill, and for everybody else providing comments. If you decide to provide written comments, wherever you can provide suggested language or words like, like channel migration zone, like you mentioned, that's going to be the most helpful for us, you know, moving forward, what edits we're going to make based on comments. So the more specific information you can provide um, about what, what you think is going to be best in the document is going to be really helpful for us. So thank you. Great, happy to do that. Um, yeah, um, yeah, I'm, uh, not, I'm sorry. Yeah, and I just would uh, like to quickly add while we're here at this point to any sources of publication or website as well. You know, that way we can have a, a way to research and and um, and you know get more information that way as well. Okay, perfect. Um, Bill um, mentioned this in his um, comments at the beginning, but we are you know, happy with the final stabilization report. However, we feel like 
it's more valuable for the operator and the community if there is a plan that's available at the beginning and the pre-mining phase and that a comprehensive plan up front will allow operators to streamline um, and coordinate their operations. So we would really like to see some um, investigation as to how that how some additional language could be added there that would make that more holistic and inclusive. Thank you. And I think just finally for me, um, and this is, we'll also be submitting some comments on the rule document this, this week. So I think this is more about what's in the rule document, but it's also not addressed in the best management practice document. But I don't see any language that indicates what happens when an operator does not um, use, utilize these best management practices. So the lack, the oversight and enforcement language seems to be missing um, in both documents. So that's when I when I read it, maybe I'm not maybe I'm not understanding or reading all of it, but I don't I'm not picking up on that part of anything. Yeah, yeah that that's a good comment, Jill. Um, basically, um, I'm going to try to um, explain it, but um, the rule in the rule, you don't really address that um, as well as the BMP's document. It's understood that if there's a rule and it has requirements, and then of course that in this case trickle to the BMP's guidance document that need to be implemented or documented if they're not feasible, and it includes the final civilization report requirements. At this time, then if an operator is not following that, then when an investigation is conducted or if we as an agency become aware of that somebody is not following those requirements, then that's when an enforcement action will, will kick in a violation or proceed with formal enforcement. So, you know, we as an agency have to touch some enforcement. And formal enforcement with, can be a notice of violation or it can be a formal enforcement that proceeds to a, a, a formal enforcement action, an agreed order. But, <clears throat> sorry, you know, an, an agreed order. But in this case, you know, in the rule itself, we're not going to include that information because we have a separate process for that. We have an enforcement process. Our investigators have an, uh, a separate process for that. So we are in the rule just saying these are the requirements. And it's understood that if somebody's not following them, then there's going to be, um, I guess, an effect for that that the agency is going to have to follow to address that with the operators. So I'm not sure if I clarified it at all, but Michaela, if you want to add to that explanation, or Michael. I don't think I have anything to add in this. Um, maybe Michael does. Um, well, do you feel the comment was, uh, the question was answered? That provided clarity, thank you. Yeah, what, what Rebecca was trying to say is there's already a mechanism to, uh, to handle this situation with, you know, our complaint driven compliance process. So uh, because there's already a mechanism, you wouldn't want to do, you know, like redundancy can be problematic sometimes with rules when, when you, if the words, you know, give a different uh, meaning in the language and then, you know, it's separate from what the enforcement function does. So that's kind of the basis of the policy behind it, if that makes sense. Sure. Yeah, thank you. And that that's my final comments and questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jill. Yeah, thank you, Jill. Uh, up next, uh, we're going to go to uh, the conference line where Brant Manchin has been listening. And Brant has uh, indicated that he'd like to provide some comments. Uh, Brant, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Uh, if you don't mind, uh, just speak up for us and uh, go ahead and provide your comments. All right, thank you very much. I appreciate uh, TCEQ um, holding this um, 
guidance document uh, meeting, and I had a couple of thoughts. I've already submitted some comments, and so um, that has most of my concerns in it. But one of the things I thought that was missing was the uh, the watershed description doesn't include San Jacinto County. And one of my concerns is there are sand resources in San Jacinto County and various streams in the East Fork. Those through there winters by a, um, a variety of streams. And what I didn't want to have happen was an operator saying, oh, I can just move a few miles, you know, above the Liberty County uh, boundary, and I don't have to comply with any of this stuff. Um, so I'd like to include San Jacinto uh, County also uh, within the, the boundaries. Um, uh, in addition, um, I understand Josh's concern about flexibility for various operators. Um, my perspective, and I used to be in air quality uh, for many, many years, is while that's true, it's really important that the agency um, make it very clear in the regulations as well as the guidance document what must be done, and it must be very simple so that the operator cannot make uh, decisions that the agencies really didn't want it to make. And I think that's really important that uh, whatever you put down is going to be simple and is required. Um, I think Bill talked about uh, musts instead of shoulds, and I echo that because uh, a should just means you ought to do it, and a must means you have to do it. So uh, there are some places in the guidance document that say, you know, equivalent to a should that in my feeling should be a must. And also there are places in the guidance document where it talks about uh, the uh, operator must check or must inspect, but it doesn't require them to document that with some sort of reporting or uh, paperwork or something like that to where a TTQ investigator or some other investigator who comes in can actually take a look and document that, in fact, the company has been doing the checks that it's uh, supposed to do. Um, and also, the last thing I want to mention is because I have a very... Um, uh, high interest in uh, riparian woodlands and biomine hardwoods. I would like to see whatever you call it, whether it's called restoration, rehabilitation, whatever of the site, that uh, as much as possible, the TCEQ educates uh, the operator and landowner to where maybe some of those sites could be restored to some of those more valuable habitats that used to be there. So uh, that's all I have to say. Um, thank you, Brent. Um, I do want to, at least for now, address one item, and that's the uh, inspection check documentation. I want to remind you and everybody that, you know, we, we did, when we looked at developing the rule as well as the BMP's document, we had to keep in mind very closely that we already have a multi-sector general permit. As I discussed, the multi-sector general permit already has the requirement to inspect, to document, to include certain records and maintain them and, um, and revise them. So we didn't want to duplicate those, that language that's already in the multi-sector general permit and include it again in the rule, include it again in the BMP's document. So just know that aside from the rule and the BMP's guidance document, we already have the multi-sector general permit that is already driving the requirements um, that sand mining facilities need to implement as required by the permit, and most of them are under sector J of the multi-sector general permit, and they have even more specific requirements because of what activities that they do as a sand mining facility. So I just want you to know that 
we are also coming from that angle. You don't, we don't want to be repetitive. We don't want to confuse things. As Michael said, the same thing for enforcement. You know, we already have a mechanism for that. We didn't want to duplicate efforts. So keep that in mind as well, that the multi-sector general permit is an integral part to this whole piece. And you have to look at all these three components together. Let, let me encourage you to, to put that in there somewhere where it, it, it refers back to that uh, other part you were just talking about because it's not clear at all. Okay, thank you. Um, I just wanted to, to, to add one more thing based on your comments, Grant, if you don't mind. You mentioned um, the San Jacinto County maybe not being in that watershed description. Um, and uh, I thank you for that comment. I also wanted to hope that you can make that comment as part of the rule language as well, not just for the BMP's guidance document, because that's really where the definition is going to live. Um, and so if you could make that comment as part of part of the, the rule comments, that would be extremely helpful. So we can review that and, and see if changes can or need to be made to clarify that. Okay, I'll try and I'll try and do that because I've got to the twenty seventh. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, thank you, Brad. Um, Bob Reak uh, asked a couple more questions in the questions box, and I see that he's left the uh, webinar, but we'll go ahead and ask him and let you guys address them for the benefit of folks who are still on. Uh, his first question was, how will you uh, prevent people pumping wastewater over dikes? at night and during storms? I, I can try and address that. So um, this rule and guidance document isn't addressing or giving anybody permission to discharge wastewaters. Um, the discharge of wastewater is regulated through permitting. And so for a facility to do that, it would be conducted as part of a wastewater permit. Um, and so there are, you know, enforcement actions that can be taken for somebody performing an illegal discharge, a discharge that's not, you know, covered under some kind of permit or a discharge that's going to harm water quality. And so um, although that is a very important issue and, and TCQ will address it, it may not be addressed as part of this because, again, this isn't a permit to allow the discharge of wastewater. This is a rule with um, best management practices to protect water quality. Rebecca, do you have anything to add to that? No, and again, uh, I mean, I just will add that, you know, what Makeda said is correct, but in addition, we do have our complaint process that, you know, Michael referred to earlier. We have a complaint process, so if you know and you're aware that this is happening at a site, you know, go to our uh, website and um, or submit an environmental complaint or call the regional office or call us and we will make sure that we go and check and see what's going on and, and why it happened and, and proceed with the appropriate um, actions as needed. But you know, if they are doing this, as Michaela said, it is not authorized if they don't have a permit to discharge you know, wastewater or process water, depending what it might be. Um, but yes, you know, anything that is against a permitting requirement or a rule um, is is not allowed and will be subject to violations or enforcement actions. All right, thank you. Um, and then Bob's other question was, uh, I've also observed miners mining over and next to pipelines. Erosion during floods then exposes and undermines them, uh, creating a safety issue. Can you add something to prohibit this practice? Sorry, Brad, can you repeat that one more time? Sure, he says that he's observed miners mining over and next to pipelines. Erosion during floods then exposes and undermines them. I presume he's referring to the pipelines again, and that creates a safety issue. Can you add something to prohibit this practice? And I'm, I'm guessing the practice he's referring to is mining adjacent to a pipeline. Okay. Uh, that is something Michael, we can look into. Yeah, we'll, we'll look into that, but you know, just 
we want to clarify that we don't have, you know, there's a mining requirement or regulating mining activities is different than regulating the discharge of stormwater and protecting water quality. All right, thank you. Um, so at this time, I don't see any hands raised and, and that was it that was in the questions box. Uh, what I'll do now is uh, for those of you who registered and indicated you want to provide comments, uh, I'm going to go ahead and call on you now and uh, give you that opportunity. Uh, so first up, uh, we're going to go to Patrick Reitmeyer. Uh, Patrick, did you have any comments you wanted to provide during today's meeting? And Patrick, if you're there, you'll need to unmute yourself by pressing the red microphone button on your control panel. All right, we may come back to Patrick shortly. Uh, next will be uh, Richard Hyde. Richard? Hey guys, uh, no, I don't. Um, I'm All sure right, we'll thank you. Comment, but thanks. Thank you, Richard. Thank you for being here today, too. Yeah. <laughs> um, how about uh, Kurt Campbell? Kurt Campbell with Westward, uh, did you want to provide any comments at today's meeting? Not at this time. All right. Thank you very much. And so uh, that was it for the folks who registered and indicated they wanted to provide comments during the meeting today. Um, I guess I'll go ahead and just ask one more time if there's anyone who's out there that would either like to ask questions or, or provide some comments, please use the raise your hand button on your control panel uh, to let us know, or you could type questions into the questions box and we'll give you just a minute to, to do that. Yeah, hey Brad, this is Bill. I don't, I can't find my uh, hand raising thing, so I'll just. Okay. Um, but there's there, there's one issue that uh, was brought up a couple of times to me, and I'd just like to get Rebecca and Michaela's uh, take on it. And it has to do with Section Five, the post mining phase. And um, it says the post mining phase stabilization is dependent on the agreement with the landowner. So does that mean that the agreement with the landowner takes precedence over the final stabilization report that TCEQ would be requesting? Or, or which, which one takes precedent? Does TCEQ or does the landowner take precedent? Um, this is Michaela, I can try and address that. So I think what we had in mind was if you have an agreement with the landowner that um, the site is going to have some structure built on it for some kind of post mining use, then obviously where the structure is being built, there wouldn't need to be, you know, vegetation to, to control those soils because some kind of permanent structure is going to go there. So basically we, we would be reviewing their plan through the lens of what that post mining land use might look like based on an agreement with the landowner. Um, we still wouldn't, we would still require all of the items in the final stabilization report. They, they would still be required to actually stabilize the soil, remove temporary structures um, and all of that, but how they do it might depend on what kind of agreement they have for the post mining use of the land. Okay, that, uh, okay, that's fine. Thank you, Michaela. Mm -hmm. And, and maybe that's a question for Josh. Josh, typically uh, these are less or less types of situations, correct? Or do the sand miners sometimes own the, the underlying land? Yeah, it's both uh, both situations, Bill. Okay, so what happens in a situation, Rebecca and Michaela, when the underlying landowner is the, the sand miner? Um, you know, and or a subsidiary of the, the sand miner or whatever, then then how do you address that type of situation? And you don't have to answer right now. This is just something that 
I was going through some more of the, the comments, and this is one of the comments that came up. But we can address it later. I don't want to put anybody in the spot, but it's certainly something we need to think about as we, we tighten up the language. Yeah, definitely the goal is going to be that before we let them terminate any permit authorizations they have at, at the site for their operations, they need to show that, you know, whenever they're done operating and they leave, that the the potential water quality issues from unstabilized land or remaining wastes and equipment and all of that stuff is taken care of so that when the operation is over and you know they're no longer mining at the site that stormwater runoff isn't carrying away um, sediments or or wastes or debris or anything like that so they're still going to demonstrate to us through the final stabilization plan how they're going to stabilize the soils how they're cleaning the site so that um, things aren't remaining to to cause water quality issues. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. All right, everyone. I am not seeing any hands raised, and we've not gotten any new questions in the questions box. Uh, so we can make this the last call. Anyone else have any questions they'd like to ask or any comments they'd like to make? Uh, before we wrap up today's stakeholder meeting. Doesn't look like it, so I'll turn the floor over to uh, Robert for any uh, closing remarks. Thank you, Brad. Um, just before we, we let Robert close out, I want to remind everybody Brad. about providing comments on the stakeholder or excuse me, on the BMP's guidance document. So thank you for providing verbal feedback today and, and asking you know, good questions of us. But you're also welcome to submit written comments to us. Um, we're giving you 30 days, so we'd like to receive comments by August 19th. You can submit those comments to me via email, and my email is displayed here on the screen. And if you could, please include in your email subject BMP's guidance document, so it's a little easier for me to sort and, and find your, your comments. And then I just want to reiterate, like we mentioned before, the more specific your comments can be, um, the, the better it's going to be for us. If, if we just get comments saying you don't like something or you do like something, those are great, but um, it's going to be easier for us to, to make decisions and move forward with, with some more specific suggestions or feedback or you know references to, to other things maybe we haven't looked at to help guide us to language that might address concerns you have. So please submit those written comments to us by August 19. And if you can make those comments as, as specific as possible. Thank you. Yes, and I would just like to add to make sure that, um, you know, you go to our website, you know, for the sound mining rule website, we have um, the presentation it's going to be uploaded there as well as we're going to have um, the link for you to to make comments and to see the BMP's document if you haven't seen that document yet. Thank you. Okay, so now we will turn it over to Robert and let him close us up. Thanks, Michaela. Thanks, Rebecca. Thanks, Brad. So we've covered a lot of ground today. Uh, good discussion about the draft BMP's document. We reviewed proposed rule language, we reviewed rulemaking and BMP guidance document timelines, and we reviewed the BMP's guidance document and its requirements. Um, you can find updates online for updates on the rulemaking project and access to the summary agenda and handouts from this meeting. <clears throat> you can visit the following webpage, uh, and the link is there on the slides. Um, I don't know that me reading the link is going to be very productive. I'll do it anyway. HTTP www.tceq.texas.gov slash permitting slash stormwater slash sand dash mining dash rulemaking. And a recording of this meeting will be available after the meeting at the following link. www.youtube.com slash user slash TCEQ news. Or I'm sure you can just Google TCEQ YouTube and find it. So really appreciate our presenters, our stakeholders who are here with us today, um, everyone who
participated in the discussion and who listened in uh, to the information we provided. Thanks a lot. Have a great day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody.